So over time, murals decay just like anything else. Always want to create work where melanated people can find their humanity somewhere in the imagery. When we have something like this, it's remarkable. And those of us who live here, we appreciate it. People usually say, you know, I don't see color, you know, when I, when I look at people, I don't see skin tones, but those differences are the, the things that make us beautiful. And I really embrace the opportunity to be able to represent all cultures as well as my own. This is a mural encompassing like a lot of things that are important to me. I've always felt really connected to the people around here and then their stories. So I think that it's important that this mural can do more than just have an impact aesthetically. By the way of using that QR code, it can actually have an impact not only on your mental health and your spiritual health, but your physical health as well. That's, that's huge. It's overwhelming when people see something positive like that up there on the wall. I love it. Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is a beautiful uh, Thursday afternoon. Um, we are here at Waymaker Fireside Chat, having the opportunity to talk to Dr. Ade Adamson um, on really the importance of skincare. Um, I'm Joshua David, head of digital strategy here at Waymaker Journal, and uh, Dr. Adamson, it's such a pleasure. We're here on behalf of sponsorship by Vaseline, uh, the Mended Murals campaign, and uh, just really honored to see and speak to you today. I'm really happy to be here and look forward to talking about what I like talking about the most, the skin. Yeah, yeah. Um, just to kick things off, Dr. Adamson, um, I mean, you're accredited in more ways than one. You've done a lot um, within your industry um, on the ideas of dermatology and, and just skincare in general. We'd love if you can give us some more insight up about your you know, upbringing, your experience, and then we can kind of just go from there. So I'm a board certified dermatologist, so I'm... You know, I'm a physician, an MD, I went to medical school, and then I did a year um, of internal medicine, and then my residency of uh, three years of dermatology. And uh, I am a professor, an assistant professor at University of Texas at Austin, Dell Medical School, um, where I see patients, I teach students, I mentor students, and I do a lot of research. And so I'm what's called a health services research researcher, excuse me, um, so I'm interested in how effectively and efficiently we deliver care to patients with skin disease. And I'm particularly interested in um, health care disparities and uh, evidence-based medicine. And uh, the specific um, area in dermatology that I focus on is skin cancer. When, you, when we talk about this idea of researching and, and kind of implementing time and energy into better understanding our own communities, um, and I do mean the black and brown experience. What are what what is the missing factors that you can really pick off from the beginning of your career? What did you like notice immediately that had you want to pivot into this um, and put research at the forefront of your career as well? So uh, tr tr historically, as a field, dermatology um, has not uh, had the best track record of diversity, mm -hmm. um, and I mean that in multiple levels. At one level. Um, the physicians that uh, make up the specialty um, hasn't been as diverse as the population in which it serves. Mm. At another level, the educational materials that we use to teach doctors, and so that's teach doctors of uh, all 
on different stripes, not only textbooks for medical students, but mm -hmm. as well as textbooks that are um, designed for uh, dermatologists and dermatology residents mm -hmm. um, also do not reflect um, the diversity of uh, skin tones and diseases that are seen across different populations. Um, and I say that historically because there have been some strides made in order to uh, remedy that. But uh, I think that is part of the reason why there has been some uh, issues in there not being as much uh, um, uh, knowledge and research um, in the area of taking care of people that have darker skin types. Right, right. And I mean, again, that's why Vaseline is obviously kind of kicking off this conversation. And I think over the last few years, they've just been making it more of a priority um, and having people such as yourself um, in, in, you know, being able to discuss this. I think, I think even when you look in the books, right, there's most of the time they're not brown tone, um, even in the epidermis or, or the dermatology sections of these, these medical books, right? So um, can we discuss the misconceptions of skin cancer in the black and brown community? Um, what are some of the things that kind of speak out to you most about it? So uh, there's a lot of, I think, uh, misconceptions and, uh, mit, um, and, and I, zombie ideas related to uh, skin cancer in um, uh, the black community and in people that identify as non-white. Um, mm -hmm. I have some positions that some people actually uh, find controversial, but they mm -hmm. are backed by data. And let me explain. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is first, skin cancer can affect anyone of any race, any color, any ethnicity. Sure. Uh, the race and ethnicity of uh, folks that it affects the most are people that identify as non-Hispanic white, mm. full stop. They also are the population that dies at the uh, highest rate from skin cancers. Mm. But if you are a, a person that has um, a darker skin, say you'd identify as um, uh, Latinx or um, Asian writ large, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, East Asian, Southeast Asian, et cetera, sure. or of African descent, say black American, uh, your rates of developing the disease are lower and the rates of dying are lower. However, if you are in one of those minority groups and you develop skin cancer, usually it's at later stages. Mm. And because it's at later stages, you have a higher risk if you develop that cancer of dying from it. So that's the disparity that a lot of people um, um, uh, uh, bring up when they talk about healthcare disparities related to skin cancer in you know black and brown populations. Yeah, but Dr. Adamson, I mean, obviously hearing these numbers are alarming and, and I know it's like, not that they're rare cases, but we just don't hear enough about it. Um, I, I hate to sound like one of the ignorant people, but you know, it's like, well, I don't gotta wear skin. I don't gotta wear suntan lotion or or, or yeah. I don't have to put on um, sunscreen. You know, my skin loves this. You know, like I, my chocolate skin loves this. I love getting darker. Um, yeah. What what are the responsibilities that we're just not taking seriously enough about um, protecting our skin, especially melanin skin or um, you know non-white skin when it comes to to better sun exposure protection? Right. So there are a couple of parts to that question. So the first part. Uh, I would say a uh, part of the reason why there are lower survival rates related to skin cancers and people of darker skin types is because there's not a lot of education uh, mm. around what to what to look for in your skin, right. uh, how to recognize skin cancers. And so I think that is part of the reason for the, uh, the disparity, just mm. lack of knowledge. Right. Now, the second part of your uh, of your question, your statement involves, are there ways for people of color to prevent getting skin cancer. Mm -hmm. Now that is a more controversial and, um, mm. and uh, non-intuitive uh, um, uh, answer. Mm. So I did the definitive like systematic review of this topic, whether UV exposure or sun exposure is associated with the development of skin cancers. Now, let sure. me focus on melanoma because that's the skin cancer that um, um, is the, the most lethal when you get it. Is okay. that the one we don't one, see? Right, so it, it's one that you see. It's usually a, okay. a dark spot on the skin okay. um, and uh, that grows. And uh, it, in fact, it's what um, killed Bob Marley, wow. right? 
Now, if you actually look at the data, right, there have been basically little to no studies showing an association between skin cancer and sun exposure, UV, UV exposure in people that identify as black. Hmm. So the notion, so the notion that wearing sunscreen will protect people from for melanoma that identifies black is not founded in science. Hmm. Okay. Now that seems non-intuitive, but if you actually look at the data, you find that that is exactly the case. And the other thing that I would say is when people that identify as black develop melanoma, it's usually on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Really? Right. Actually, that's where Bob Marley developed it. Wow. And so I would ask you, when was the last time you had a sunburn on the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet? I couldn't tell you, Tom. Doesn't happen. You know, white wow. people, it doesn't necessarily happen. Um, and so, uh, again, I think all of this is uh, lumped together in misinformation uh, or, or, or lack of education around how skin cancers are, are a bit different sure. in people of color, specifically black people, than they are in other populations. Interesting. And so I hear on social media all the time, SPF, SPF, I'm going to get skin cancer. I've seen it on TV shows. I almost lost it when actually when I saw it on Insecure. Uh, the actress has said, you know, SPF, we're going to die of skin cancer. And I was like, what are you talking about? Okay. Right. There's actually no data to support that at all. Really? Okay. okay. Yes. And uh, there's actually been no clinical trial supporting the use of, of sunscreen to prevent skin cancer in darker skin types. Now, I don't want people to, to, to walk away from this thinking, okay. hey, this guy's crazy. This dermatologist is nuts, <laughs> right? He thinks SPF is uh, useless. I don't believe that. What I do believe um, is that it's good for a lot of other um, uh, prevention uh, 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 reasons. Okay. One is preventing sunburns. Sunburns are, are awful. They're annoying. I mean, they can cause a lot of pain and discomfort. Hyperpigmentation is something that is uh, really an issue in people with darker skin types. Of course. Sunscreen helps with that. There are certain people that are just sensitive to the sun and have photosensitive disorders. Good for that. There's also aging, right? People want their melon in the pot for as long as possible, right? Sure. This is another way for them to do that, right? Wear sunscreen, SPF, okay? So before I get attacked for, you know, <laughs> uh, dunking on sunscreen, I want to make right. sure that uh, I give you all of the facts, okay? So, so okay, so so there's, there's questions around SPF. There's questions about its relation to um, the impact, or maybe there is a lack of impact to cancer. Um, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, wearing sunscreen does have its benefits. Um, it does. You know, when we talk about hyperpigmentation, I think, you know, black men and black women, especially, you know, experience it where they shave, right? What does hyperpigmentation look like? Do we experience that same experience in the sun if we're off if we're often into it too long? Like because because I hate to say yeah. it, but isn't hyperpigmentation getting darker skin in the first place? Like tanning is that not, or, or is that a misconception yeah. as well? Yeah. So uh, hyperpigmentation is um, basically a it's just a it's a general basket term for you're getting darker. Right. Right. Um, you can uh, become a bit darker from sun exposure. Actually, every, everybody does. Mm -hmm. It's a reaction. Mm -hmm. For your skin, the melanin actually in your cells, it actually moves right in response to the sun. And it moves in such a way that um, you uh, basically become you know, darker, right? And mm. perhaps uh, like immediately, because if you ever mm. noticed in the sun, um, say, you know, within 15, 20 minutes of direct sun exposure, you're like, whoa, I'm a bit darker. That's your yeah. melanin moving inside the cells. Right? Interesting. Okay. Now, if you have enough damage, you know, from the sun, um, that can induce your uh, the cells in your in your uh, in your skin that make melanin to produce more, right? And some of them will produce so much that they create little sunspots, right? Which is evidence of sun damage. Got it. Okay. And so that's why people, certain people, you know, get freckles, and people mm -hmm. can get freckles whether they're white or they identify as non-Hispanic, uh, white as uh, uh, as well, and that's you know, evidence of, of sun damage. And those are little small dots of hyperpigmentation you know, from that, okay. right? So it's all, it's all the same term, right? Sure. But sure. Uh, describing a phenomena, but um, 
but how you arrive at that is a bit different. Now, sure. there are other types of hyperpigmentation that may say are related to uh, um, uh, hormones, right? Like melasma okay. is an okay. example of that, um, where people get dark spots around kind of their, their eyes, right, their forehead. Um, and um, often that happens as a, as a result of uh, hormonal changes that people go, go through uh, throughout life. Got it. Okay, so here's here's the next question. I think so. If you see the sunspots on your hand, right? I'm in my early 30s, right? And I was like, where'd these freckles come from, right? And I'm like going on the internet and starting Life. to panic search. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, is is are those uh, flares of concern for for uh, you know the black and brown community if if these sunspots start to become evident? Because as you said, they do pop up in different places, right? Because I had no idea, but it there is movement in our melanin, which is so fascinating to even hear. Yeah. Um, from you, Doc. So would love to know if, if what, what are the warning signs um, that our community, you know, should start, you know, when it comes to being more responsible and checking in with the body, like, what are yeah. some of the, 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 the red flags or yellow flags that you think we should start paying attention to um, on our body? So I'd say in general, everybody should be acquainted with, with their skin. Mm -hmm. um, and know where the, the spots they've had and, you know, roughly how long they've been there. You know, mm. uh, a lot of people have spots that have been on themselves for, uh, for, for many years. Those are way less concerning than something that popped up within sure. the last month or two sure. that also starts growing fast. And I'm talking, you know, say doubling in a month, tripling in size mm. uh, in a month. Those are kind of spots that you should flag or your doctor to look at, uh, preferably a board certified dermatologist. But uh, if you can't, you know, see um, uh, one of those, your primary care physician who, who then could refer you uh, to someone. Other aspects to worry about is a mole that's changing a lot of colors. Okay. It's getting grays in it. It's getting uh, really d dark, uh, you know, dark blue hues, you know, black hues. Um, a mole that is uh, itching. Um, a mole that is spontaneously bleeding. So it just randomly starts oh. to bleed, okay. right? These are all things that uh, you should think about. And as I said earlier, um, if you develop a, uh, a skin cancer, and I'm talking usually melanoma, it's usually on the palms of the hands. So the dark spots on the palms of the hands or under the fingernail, as an example, people, wow. people can get these really large dark streaks down their fingernail that sometimes can be evidence of melanoma. So wow. these are all the reasons why, you know, you should go and see your dermatologist. If you don't have any of these uh, issues, you don't necessarily have to see your dermatologist, you know, every year or anything like that. But certainly if you have a concern, you should go and get checked. Have a low, have yeah. a low threshold for that. You know, I, I appreciate you so much for sharing that. Um, I know you mentioned, you know, sunspots, you know, they're said to be within the category of skin disorders. Um, a type of hyperpigmentation. Is there another form of skin disorders that our communities may not be educated in that could that you could shed some light on? I mean, you, you've already kind of said some already, right? Like under the nails. I mean, these are such unique places that these skin disorders kind of develop. Um, I mean, in your career thus far, have you seen a lot of us with these with some of these these cases? Is it rare for you to experience some of this as of right now? So I would say hyperpigmentation is probably one of the most common reasons why uh, folks of color come to the dermatologist. Okay. Um, because the rates of skin cancer specifically are much lower in mm -hmm. say uh, black and brown folks, sure. uh, that is much less a, a, a reason for the visits to you know, dermatologists. Um, okay. But I'm not gonna say that I have not had you know, many folks um, of color that have come and seen me because of uh, actually having a skin cancer or being worried about mm. having skin cancer. But I would say it's pigmentation usually is what um, bothers um, folks of color a lot uh, uh, the most. Yeah. And I would say, actually, if you think about acne, which is probably one of the most common dis dermatologic disorders uh, that we deal with, um, what really bothers people with light skin is the redness. But what really bothers people with darker skin are the dark spots, mm -hmm. right? And so um, trying to navigate that is really important and takes a dermatologist that is comfortable with dealing with skin across the kaleidoscope of skin tones. 
Doc, I have to ask, do you find yourself dealing with patients that come to you because maybe their original dermatologist didn't have to be a person of color and didn't have the wherewithal or the knowledge to really speak on some of the issues that they're coming to them with? Like, have you gotten a, a, a large kind of, I guess, intake of, of clients? Because of that? I, I wish I uh, could say that um, uh, that has not been the case, but mm -hmm. you, your, uh, your sense is correct. Uh, mm -hmm. I certainly have had um, patients that I've seen that uh, either have not felt seen by their uh, dermatologist mm -hmm. um, that did not feel like their uh, needs were necessarily addressed. Now, is it because of an issue of um, improper diagnosis? Diagnosis, excuse me. Was it an issue of just rapport? You know, actually, I've I've seen I've seen both, um, which is uh, unfortunate, but. It is uh, something that does happen. Mm. I would say that it's not. I would. It is not something that's very common. Okay, but it is certainly something that uh, does occur. Mm. And another thing that I've I've also seen is a lot of uh, of people uh, with darker skin tones. They just like seeing uh, folks that have similar skin uh, as they do, just as a preference. And so they may seek me out over another dermatologist as a result. And yeah. that's just the preference that some people have, I would say, in the same way in uh, OBGYN. Uh, some um, women would like to see women OBGYNs and not uh, folks that are men who may be equally capable of uh, rendering appropriate uh, clinical care. Right, right. That makes total sense. I think, um, I think, I think the next topic is really kind of focusing on the the two that I think that are super prevalent in our communities, you know, obviously, you know, hyperpigmentation we talked about, but psoriasis yeah. and eczema, right? I think those are, yeah. are, are two top heavy hitters. So why is it that eczema cases are so much more prevalent in the black and brown communities? Or am, could I be wrong about that? Is, I just feel like that's something, even as a child, middle school, I just always notice that that's something that we, we have in our community, right? So their, their prevalences are roughly similar across um, uh, for both eczema as well as psoriasis. Maybe okay. psoriasis is slightly more in uh, folks that identify as, as, uh, as black, mm -hmm. um, but it's not like a two to one ratio or three to one ratio or, or something like that. Got it. Um, so I don't know which one you want to tackle first because they're both yeah. slightly different. Yeah, of course. Um, um, well, first let's, let's go through the eczema, the, the eczema, excuse me, eczema route. Like, um, yeah, I mean, I'd love to know your take on it and how you know, this, and again, I know they're somewhat connected, so there may be some, yeah. some, some crossovers, but we'll let's just, they're certainly crossovers. Them. Yeah, they're certainly. So the way I would group them together, they're inflammatory disorders. So Got they're it. inflammatory disorders of the skin, okay. um, that are kind of disturbances in the immune system of the skin. Uh, actually one of the reasons why I got into dermatology, because I was, uh, obsessed with the basic science of, of the immune system. And you can mm. think of the, of the, of the skin, because it is basically the barrier to the world, mm -hmm. it is loaded. It is loaded mm -hmm. with cells of mm -hmm. your immune system. So it's a mm -hmm. huge immunologic organ. Mm -hmm. And when that kind of gets perturbed, you can have disorders like eczema or psoriasis. So let's talk about uh, eczema. It's a sure. disorder, you know, also called atopic dermatitis, okay. um, where uh, uh, people often get uh, red spots. Um, they might even uh, have like breaks in their skin. Um, they usually have certain areas that are, are more prone, like uh, the inside of the elbows, right. the backs of the knees. Right. Um, but it can affect uh, just about everywhere um, uh, on the skin. Mm -hmm. And uh, it usually manifests itself in the, it's in the largest, at least the largest proportion of the population are, are kids that have eczema. Right. And people, you know, kind of, quote unquote, grow out of it over time. Right. But there are adults that also can persist in having eczema or even develop it um, when they're much older. Okay. So when people are diagnosed with eczema and they identify as, as, as black, they often have it a little bit more severe. Now, there's been a, a thread through the literature where they would like to say that this difference is related to genetics. Um, I would uh, I would say that that is uh, um, that kind of race based medicine is is troubling. Uh, I would say that 
Um, if there is a genetic component, it is probably very small okay. to explain the differences in eczema and darker skin versus lighter skin. Most of the difference probably is related to the environment. We Got know uh, eczema is uh, worse in uh, people that are exposed to pollution in urban areas um, that may be exposed to uh, dust mites or, right. or mice or roaches or just wow. environment, even psychological stress. You know, uh, 100% as well. absolutely. Yes, sir. Right. All of these things burden disproportionately people that identify as black. And Dr. Adamson, when we talk about it, not just being, um, you know, infants, but also being in older cases, or excuse me, older patients, um, more mature patients, forgive me. Um, we're talking again about that probably being a slightly disproportionate, right? Because when we're talking about the psychological impacts, you know, again, we're talking about immunity. Um, and I think too often we, we don't really understand, nor do I think we want to, because it just gets uncomfortable where, you know, the gut and the biome right and the relationship that it has with the skin is very much so i would think kind of intertwined yeah. and so when we talk about the psychological impact of uh this possibly being more impacting in the black and brown communities it's well there's a lot more stressors that are happening on a daily basis for those kind of people whether it's economic impacts um familial caribbean you know kind of things um are you are you also seeing that that almost on a higher rate between so when we talk about the babies we're talking about the urban communities most likely being in places where there's some type of chemical exposure or there's some type of environmental impacts, right? And then versus our older, more mature communities, it's again, economics, stress, keeping up the lights on in the house. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what, what, what's the solution there when it comes to that? Because again, this is sometimes stress related, right? Like what are the yeah. immediate fixes or the immediate um, reliefs or, or actions that we as a community can take in order to kind of help alleviate the situations when it comes to eczema. Yeah. Um, and so when we talk about uh, some of the issues that you're bringing up, I kind of lump them into what's called social determinants of health. 100%. Right? Yeah. There are things that um, are about the system and yeah. not necessarily the person. And so those are a lot harder to fix, right? 100%. Better housing, better access to education, mm -hmm. food, uh, regular movement. Mm -hmm. All of these things that um, um, that can impact your skin health, not only in um, eczema, but also in psoriasis right. as as well. And so, you know, that involves us improving, I think, things even beyond the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. But some healthcare system fixes um, would be, um, as an example, um, would be making it easier for you to say, see your board certified uh, dermatologist uh, for a consultation, um, maybe through uh, 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 through the way that we run our clinics, um, the insurances that that we take, um, the types of you know teleservices that maybe we provide, all of these different things that uh, the health system could could do. But again, I think that would pale in comparison to some of the structural issues that just are part of the society that um, could be much better. Yeah, Dr. Adamson, is dermatology considered one of the vanity kind of uh, specialties? Like, you know, if my general practitioner can't tell me what's going on, is that something that, because again, we talk about medical insurance, that's, yeah. that's another, it's another socioeconomic impact that a lot of us may not have. Is my, derm is my doctor going to say, here's a dermatologist, let alone be a black dermatologist, let alone be someone that is board certified, that can look at my issues as a black or brown person coming to you with these issues? Is, is, that, is that also kind of another hurdle, another obstacle with which a lot of our communities face, and then especially in our urban communities that are not able to kind of get this education moment that I'm getting with you right now? So I would say there's a couple layers there. Oh, One. God. <laughs> yeah, one is that um, derma, dermatologists are rare just to, to begin with. Yeah. There aren't that many practicing dermatologists in the U.S. It's somewhere between, I don't know, uh, 12,000 12, maybe or to 15 or so, something like that. Only about 3% uh, of them identify as black, right? When in the population, they're more like, you know, 13%. Yeah, the numbers are, are staggering. Yeah. And in fact, if you look at academic dermatologists, that number is even smaller. And then if you look at 
academic terminologists, so these are the ones usually that do the research, okay. that identifies black males, you're looking at one of 16 in the USA. I'm sorry, say that again. One of 16, like 16, one six? One six, yeah. Academic black male dermatologist. Yeah, and, okay. I, I, and I, think, <laughs> I think I personally know at least at least half of them right um so so the situation from a, a diversity and equity yeah. lens is quite dire yeah um, and so uh, the other thing that i would say is while it you know in a in a ideal world it would be great if people had the choice of what kind of dermatology they saw what they look like that is just not feasible and i don't necessarily mm -hmm. think that's what we want Mm -hmm. right, what we want is every single dermatologist, regardless of their background, to be comfortable taking care of people from uh, whatever background. Mm -hmm. But I still do think that it's important to have a diverse workforce so that people have an option, right? They're not, uh, you know, uh, uh, that want that option, have that option, right? And then finally, the other thing that I would say uh, that you brought up is um, about whether dermatologists are considered kind of a vanity uh, specialty. I think sometimes we get uh, a, a bad rap in, mm -hmm. in, in that sense. And, you know, I, I think some of it has to do how we get portrayed and portray ourselves on, on mm -hmm. social media. We're very okay. cosmetic heavy, cosmetic focused, but sure. uh, you know, it takes a lot of training in order to really get to uh, a position of a board certified dermatologist and we're really about the study of disease that's primarily what mm. our training is about and a small portion of it is about cosmetics um and but i think you know because the public that's something that they really care about a lot of dermatologists also lean into that um but you know seeing a dermatologist we are doctors we do see you know uh, patients um but lastly what i'll say on that and this um, it may be a somewhat controversial, but it's a, a true statement, um, is that often dermatologists uh, don't take certain insurances like Medicaid, right, mm. which, is, um, uh, which is for people that are of lower socioeconomic status um, and disproportionately uh, the people that are uh, of color. And so I think all of those reasons, you know, play into, the, you know, the problem. I'm not going to lay blame on any one, you know, part. It's, it's just the system. I don't even know what to say after that, Doc. I mean, you just you just hit the. I mean, so do you have in your mind why there's such a low disproportionate rate of black male doctors in this in this this uh, this practice, especially when it's something that, granted, it's not large doses of our community being impacted by this. It's still very much so an important fact with which more of us should be a part of these conversations. I mean, I'm learning a ton from you right now, just just in this, right? Granted, I may not have any of these issues, but this is something again that's very much so infused in our communities, and we just, I mean, it's baffling to me. One in I mean, sixteen. I mean, y'all, sixteen. Y'all, I can send really you the paper could, if you want. If you don't believe, y'all can meet up to play golf every couple so, of months. Like it's we should. You know, we should have like some some kind of group. We should all pose for a photo, just one frame. Be like, look, here's all of the black male academic dermatologists in the country. One photo, boom. You know, right there. Yeah. So, what what was the experience like for you in, in understanding that, especially with everything that you've done thus far to get to this place? Like, how did being, I get here? Like, how did I end up as a one of those? I think it's 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 how did you end up here is my first part, but I think the second part in it is having the knowledge that you have now having the vernacular that you have now and understanding how ridiculously low it is, even amongst the other 15 brothers that are in this space, um, what do you guys find as the solutions in being able to deal with it being this low as far as keeping our people educated on these kind of situations? So it's, it's about beefing up the pipeline as best as possible, mm -hmm. you know, um, reaching back high school, college, um, you know, uh, medical students try to, you know, com convince them that dermatology is a, is, is a space for you. Uh, and there have been a lot of dermatologists. And, um, you know, I need to shout out uh, specifically uh, the black women dermatologists 
that uh, really have been on the forefront of really trying to grow that pipeline of mm. black dermatologists, mm. um, you know, both, you know, for, for to increasing number of, of black women as well as black men um, in the field. And so I think that is really important. And kind of what I would tell you about how did I end up here? It was it was two black dermatologists that um, I was able to meet while I was a um, while I was a a Med medical student. student. Yep. Right. Uh, and they weren't in academics. They were not in academics. Um, it was <laughs> it was their influence in meeting them that kind of solidified. Or I had an interest in it, but they kind of solidified it as this is somewhere where you belong, where you can go to. Um, and uh, fun fact is that. Uh, um, the way I met them is actually through my wife. She was the girlfriend. She was my girlfriend at the time. And her sister was that dermatologist. And her sister's husband is also a dermatologist. Wow. Um, and so that is how I ended up in, in, in the field. And uh, so uh, I, I credit them for really showing me that, yeah, you can do this, right? Because if you kind of look, like you don't, like if you, if you don't see yourself. Yeah. Right. In a community, in a group, it's a lot harder for you to want to do all that it takes to get there. Right. 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 And it takes you seeing that right for you to want to, you know, um, uh, become a dermatologist. At least that's how I feel. And so I yeah. think that, um, you know, we need to make a, a welcoming environment for uh, potential students um, to see that this is something that they can do. I you know, it goes back to the whole representation matters, but I'd love to know, Dr. Adamson, like, uh, is it significantly higher black female dermatologists versus? Oh, certainly. It's at least, let's say a double, triple, quadruple. <laughs> oh, it's, it's oh I knew it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's significant. Ugh. I mean, they're the best students. So they're the best students. Love all black sisters. I'm, I'm, right? I'm just put that out there. Gotta love okay. them. Gotta love them. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's so so you know we talk back to inflammatory and so um, walking into psoriasis um, is is it eczema and then psoriasis or is it psoriasis and then eczema like how does that how does that typically t uh, fall into place? Um, I'd love yeah. to know more. So they're two s separate disorder; they're distinct mm -hmm. um, and they don't really o overlap. It's either okay. one di diagnosis or the other. In the rare okay. case, they may kind of look similar. But okay. usually, you know, with time, with say a biopsy, more testing, um, you can differentiate the two. Okay. Right. And psoriasis, because we haven't talked as much about that, um, that manifests as these uh, these small or large what we call plaques, um, which are kind of raised, usually raised area of the skin mm -hmm. that uh, have kind of a silvery scale, you know, yeah. on them, yeah. um, and it can often affect uh, the um, over the joints, so like the elbows, the knees, it can get in your hair, your ears. Um, and in some cases, it can even affect your joints. Wow. And um, there have been a number of disparities, mostly related to treatment associated with um, the disorder, meaning that uh, people that identify as black have had less access to some of the breakthrough treatments that we've had for psoriasis, some of the expensive breakthrough treatments we've had for psoriasis. Um, and again, you know, there's an issue of access, dollars and cents, uh, maybe trust, that I think prevents some equity in that space. I, Dr. Adamson, you know, I think I read somewhere that, you know, it's, it's sometimes silver, purple, um, you know, I'll never forget that I remember in middle school, there was a student that she had it on her neck, elbows, the inners, the knees. Um, is it that, is it that impactful or does it, does it just look more jarring on our skin? Uh, does it still impact, um, you know, POCs that are not as melanated? Um, does it have that same kind of scaly, you know, impactful look that it has on, on black and brown skin? It, it can. Okay. Uh, it can, even if you're, you know, light, lighter skin as well. Uh, maybe it might look a little more red than it does purple when you're Got when it. you're much darker. Got it. Um, but uh, regardless, I think I, I mean I would say whether you have really light skin, you identify as white, or if you're black, 
it is a disorder that can really be psychologically sure. uh, debilitating because yeah. it's so visible and people worry about, oh, do you have an infection? You know, is this contagious? Mm -hmm. You know, um, can I actually, you know, shake your hand, you know, uh, or maybe you're unkempt and, you know, you're, you're not taking care of yourself, these yeah. kind of things. So it can, you know, have uh, uh, a lot of a lot of impact. And especially if it's bad, right? If you yeah. if you're if you're someone that is unable to get the treatment, yeah. or you know maybe it's un or under recognized, yeah. um, then uh, or maybe your primary care physician has a has a higher threshold if you're darker to send you to a, a dermatologist. You know maybe that impacts you even more. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that um, uh, across the board, no matter race ethnicity, it can be a a, a bad a bad disease. What are, you know, and I appreciate you, you know, additionally sharing that. Um, so you're saying that it cannot always be one or the other. It's never a case where there's, there's patients that can have both of them, can it? Like, just, just wondering. I have not encountered that. You mean okay. eczema and atopic dermatitis at the same time? Right. It's, that's not something that, uh, I, I, I'm sure it's, it's happened. Wow. But uh, usually the, uh, the one of them dominates as the, okay. as the, as the immunologic abnormality that somebody has uh, on their skin. Got it. Okay. You know, when, when we're talking about the future of dermatology for the black and brown communities and just the POC communities in general, um, in your own opinion, how do you feel advertising dollars? Do you feel like those are being spent correctly coming from your side, right? I mean, and let's not even go near the educational pipeline, but I think just on an educational level, right? Like, um, do you feel like coming from the the research side, as well as just kind of being a practicing doctor. Um, are you feeling like we're missing the mark on that when it comes to touching base with our own communities and, and, and properly educating us about it? I think that historically, yes, we have missed the mark. Mm -hmm. But right now, there are a lot of different ways in which we are trying to hit that mark. You know, as uh, um, I would say, as an example, Vaseline, and, right. you know, mended murals and, and um, see my skin, right? Yeah. A resource um, right. developed for the community for folks to go and look at various disorders on their skin that might not be uh, seen in right. a Google search, right? Right. In a Google right. search that uh, primarily prioritize skin of lighter complexion. When you say, mm -hmm. you know, what does eczema look like or what does Lyme disease look like, et cetera. Right. And so um, I think it's very heartening that, uh, you know, brands like, you know, Vaseline and some others are are embracing right. this um, idea um, that um, we have to do a better job of representation, not only in like the images that we show, but uh, in some of the resources that we um, have for people and how we design our products, et cetera. And I would say in the research world, in the research world, there also is more of a recognition that health disparities are something that's important. Um, mm -hmm. There have been um, way more publications related to uh, skin of color um, um, across the different dermatology journals that uh, that, that we have, um, and there has also been a concerted effort by the uh, leadership, mostly. Um, leadership of black and brown dermatologists to improve the diversity of clinical trials as well so okay. that we can make sure that all of the innovations that we see in the field um, are developed with everyone in mind. In mind. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And I would say even in the tech space, I think that there's a, a growing appreciation that um, uh, there uh, and when I, as as it relates to dermatology, at least um, that um, we need to design uh, models yeah. like uh, uh, machine learning models that uh, incorporate diverse data sets that represent, like I said, the kaleidoscope of skin tones that we have uh, in the world. Yeah, this has just been so educational, Dr. Adamson. I, I'd love to before you go, um, in in your mind, top five factors that you'd think. Are something that you'd love to share with the community that that are, are important um, takeaways um, just from this conversation or just in general that you know I wish our community would have more knowledge of this as the top five most important things to 
take after, implement? Um, you know, what's what's something that you'd love to share with us? Okay, so uh, the first couple, I'll um, because it's my specialty, skin cancer. Of candy, course, yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> let me let me, uh, let me give you two there. One um, is if you see a mole on the palms of your hands, soles of your feet, uh, that is growing, changing, you know, uh, uh, bleeding, uh, is of any concern. Please go see a board certified dermatologist um, in order to get it evaluated. Mm -hmm. Now, I would say that as it relates to any kind of uh, spot on your body, but especially uh, there. Number two, sunscreen. I think sunscreen is important to wear for many reasons. None of those reasons are skin cancer prevention, okay? Because there's no data to support that sunscreen is going to prevent cancer if you identify as, uh, as black. Now, it will help for hyperpigmentation, uh, for anti-aging, uh, for uh, uh, preventing sunburns, for um, uh, helping if you have a sun-sensitive condition like, say, lupus or something like that. Sure. Right, so those are the two that I would say for skin cancer. For, for hyperpigmentation, I would also say, uh, that's number three, I would say, um, please go to your board certified dermatologist to get an, an evaluation about having your hyperpigmentation you know, treated, especially younger people that get acne, right? It is a lot easier to prevent hyperpigmentation if you appropriately have your acne treated. Mm. Right before the hyperpigmentation kicks sets in, because in. Yep. Okay. once it kicks in, it is a lot more difficult for it uh, to resolve. So that's number three. Mm -hmm. Number four, we didn't even touch on this, and that's <laughs> hair loss. This is hair loss, okay? Mm. Like I said, dermatologists do hair, skin, and nails. All right? See, I'm not. I didn't even think of that, Doc. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Please continue. Yeah. Sorry. And so, um, women, particularly black women get a um, condition called CCCA, which is a type of scarring hair loss, okay, where they basically lose hair on the top of their head and it ends up, you know, spreading outward. And usually this happens slowly over time. Mm -hmm. And what happens is uh, women try to compensate by having a wig or doing their do a certain way or braiding it a, a certain way. And then by the time they make it to the dermatologist, they have lost so much hair, it is um, impossible, um, if uh, difficult, if not impossible, to get it back. So if you notice that you have you know, burning on your scalp, losing your hair, please see a dermatologist. We are the experts in taking care of people that uh, have hair loss. Yeah. And number five, hmm, I'm trying to think. What I would say is since we talked about atopic dermatitis and psoriasis, which is inflammatory disorders, um, there too, do not hesitate to go see a dermatologist. In fact, demand to see a dermatologist if you're, pri if you're with your primary care physician because we are the specialty that takes care of, of disease of the skin. Um, and we can make sure that you're on the, the most up-to-date, most evidence-based treatment for those disorders. Uh, Doc, I, I appreciate you giving so much insight. I can't help but ask just for the brothers. I think so many of us dealing with shaving, right? Um, mm -hmm. That hyperpigmentation that we all deal with with our chin, you know, our cheeks, you know, you know, is there, is it really just going to the dermatologist and trying to figure those out? Or are there better ways that we can manage at home um, in dealing with those kind of those kind of symptoms or, or issues that most of us deal with on a day to day basis, right? Especially in corporate America, I think. Yeah. So I don't necessarily think uh, resorting to the dermatologist is the immediate thing that you do, yeah. although okay. if that's what you want to do, I okay. think that certainly is where you can get uh, the best information uh, that will help you as an individual. Mm -hmm. um, there are some best practices um, that people should abide by. One, that's making sure that uh, when you shave, uh, you do it with the grain, not against the grain. You make sure that you prep the area so that it is... Uh, warm. So I always tell patients to, you know, shave um, after they shower, after they've had a lot of, you know, warmth on their, uh, on their face or take a really warm towel and, you know, keep it on their face for a few minutes before 
um, before shaving because that lets the the uh, makes the, the hairs stand up so that when you cut them, um, it's not an angle and it reduces the chance of them you know going back in, in, into your into your skin. Right. And then I, I would also say you know try to use a, an aftershave that uh, doesn't have alcohol in it that's really drying. Use something that um, is alcohol free and really moisturizes uh, the the area. And you know be you know be consistent about it. But again, have a low threshold to go into dermatologist if these kind of basic best practices uh, don't help. It sure. may require some kind of prescription medication to help either with the hyperpigmentation or with preventing some of the um, bumps, uh, what's called uh, pseudofilliculitis barbie or PFB right. That, right. Uh, that happens. Yeah. And Doc, one last question just because it's going crazy on TikTok. Are you sure it's the last one? You sure? I promise. I promise. I promise. <laughs> Not sure. Biotin is uh it's micro ingredients uh biotin right now i'm familiar with a lot of this stuff but it's the new craze everyone's now doing biotin mm. supplement and yeah. glue yeah. glue gluathene glue gluathene gluathione gluathione and mm. you know that's how you keep your skin great um are the new one that's the new okay. one that's the new okay. wave right now it's it's in the TikTok shop everybody's getting it um, R is taking the biotin gummies and all these things, you know, especially for mm-hmm. black and brown communities, we're yeah. all trying to figure out how to do better with keeping, you know, especially the, the front of our foreheads and, and thickening the hair and, and yeah. doing the tea trails and all these things. Um, yeah. have you seen the benefits in all these practices being utilized so aggressively, like over supplementing and all these things? Like, is, is our community really seeking those benefits because again you don't see that it's not it's not black influence talking about it as much i i'm Definitely. realizing that it's the asian community that's like this is how my mom's mm-hmm. kept kept young so well so i would love to know some yeah. insight from you what you think so i think um a lot of people are drawn to anecdotes a lot of people are drawn to, <laughs> yeah you know this worked for me so it should work for you my yeah. grandma did this my my aunt did that etc um and frankly i would say the biotin theoretically it's something that uh, could potentially help. Biotin is an important ingredient or cofactor in the development of hair and nails. Mm -hmm. So taking it can't really harm you, right? Now, is there strong evidence that it will help you, that you will have lush, full hair as a result? I would say that the data supporting that is sparse Mm. um, and not of extremely high quality. Um, But again, if you feel like it helps, it you know doesn't harm you, go ahead and do it. This is what sure. I tell patients as well. Um, and there are a lot of fads out there, and on social media. I mean, there've been fads even before social media, for sure, for sure. Um, um, about different potions and things that are keep you young, et cetera. The obsession of about uh, being young and you know still having it uh, that is not unique to our generation, yeah. or you know. The next boomers one. or yeah. you know gen so, xers i mean yeah. you know, alpha, everybody yeah. wants to say young you know yeah. um and there's a whole philosophical discussion you can have about you know uh, culture whether you know we should grace uh, age gracefully and just take it etc we don't have to go down that road but i would say is if it makes you feel good and it's something that you know doesn't harm you sure you can try it but i i doubt that glutathione just like many other Things that have been fads in the past are really going to be robust in mm-hmm. terms of helping you. To me, there are three things that are, that are actually evidence-based that help. SPF, a good moisturizer, and some kind of retinoid. Okay. Everything else, to me, you know, vitamins, all of that kind of stuff, just has weak evidence. Mm. But again, if you want to spend your money doing that, have at it. Spend your money doing that. <laughs> Dr. Addison, it's been such a pleasure. Uh, on behalf of Waymaker Journal and and my entire team, we just want to thank you so much for this and just want to thank Vaseline for this opportunity and being able to get so much knowledge from you. Um, definitely hope to talk to you and keep in touch. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Thanks for having me.